Good afternoon, everyone. I see you don't like each other very much. You're all sitting all by yourselves and all over the place here. You're going to make me work hard, I see. I might have to come all the way back there to the back. <laughs> well, this is, a, this is quite a topic when you start talking about Lord as families teach us to pray. Some of the hardest uh, places that people find is praying with a spouse, praying with their families. It's not the easiest of things. Many of us struggle with this. Um, this, this summer marks 39 years of my wife and I being married, my wife Lisa, and uh, she's my best friend. She's my favorite prayer partner. She, uh, she gets more beautiful every year. Our marriage gets sweeter all the time. And there are times when I'm, I'm driving in the car, and I look over at my beautiful wife, my so smart wife, and I get filled with these, just infatuation with her. I just get filled with this sense of, oh God, thank you for this woman. And then she starts to make these noises. They're these sound effects. What are you doing? Why do you drive like this? <laughs> and in 15 seconds, I go from romance to want to kick her out of the car at 65 miles an hour. Because we are really opposites. Um, she's a verbal processor. So everything she does, she wants my opinion on it. She wants to brainstorm with me. She wants me to help her, you know, create and do all this stuff. I've been preaching for 30 some odd years. Every Saturday she says, what are you preaching on? I say, sin. <laughs> Still against it. Because I don't let people into my process. I'm an, I'm an internal processor. She gets so frustrated with me. I get so frustrated with her. Um, I'm a very direct speaker. Even though I grew up in Mississippi, I have no tact, very little diplomacy. I fit in in New York really well. <laughs> My wife is incredibly diplomatic. She's very indirect. She's very tactful. So early on in our marriage, she would say something like this on a Saturday. Do you want to clean the garage today or do you want to cut the grass? <laughs> and all I heard were the words, do you want? I want to do neither of those. I want to watch as many football games as I possibly can and never leave the couch. I didn't know she was meaning you will you will cut the grass, you will clean the garage, you have no other choice. She always thought she was being so diplomatic, giving me two choices. <laughs> so we found that if we were going to not just survive, but if we were gonna thrive as a couple, we had to first develop a prayer life together. And when we started, we, we were not good at it. Um, I didn't like the way she prayed. She didn't like that I fell asleep when she was praying. <laughs> I would start snoring and I'd wake up and remember where I was in my prayer and start it up again. She goes, don't even try that. We struggled, we wrestled with it, but we knew that we had to pray, we had to appropriate and begin to activate the promises of God for our marriage and for our family. I have two kids, they're both grown, and we knew that they needed prayer covering. Hard to be preacher's kids, hard to be pastors or any ministry to be a kid in that, very hard. And so we, we did what uh, the disciples did. We said, Lord, teach us to pray. And we pretty much have been praying that prayer together for the last 26 years. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. And uh, I began to realize as I looked at things, the disciples didn't ask 
Jesus to teach him anything else but prayer. And I began to realize, you know, Jesus, Jesus healed the sick. He delivered the, the demonic. He preached with authority, he taught with authority. But they knew what you and I need to know, and that is everything he did, he did from his prayer life. Amen. That if you could pray, you could preach. If you could pray, you could deliver people from demons. If you could pray, you could heal the sick, see the lame walk. But if you didn't pray, you couldn't do those things in the same way. Because Jesus said, I do nothing of my own initiative. I only do what I see the Father doing. And Jesus said, the things I do, you shall do, and greater things than these, because I go to the Father. So therefore, it is open to you and me to see the things that Jesus saw if we're willing to access those things through prayer. And so as a couple, we began to commit ourselves to prayer about 26 years ago. And God has taught us many things about family, about prayer, but primarily, I want to start off our session with the whole idea is that not only do you have an individual calling, but you have a family calling. You have a marriage calling. Because I'm near a college and I teach at the college and I'm near a seminary, I do a lot of weddings, I do a lot of premarital counseling. And one of the, the last sessions that I do, the, the first session that I always do is, is just getting the couple to understand their own personality and their own wiring, how God made them. Then we talk about communication. We talk about conflict resolution. We go through all of these things that are so important for marriage. But the last one that I always get to is this. What's the mission of this marriage? Why are you together? What is it that you can accomplish together that you couldn't accomplish apart from each other? And then I always ask them this. I say, tell me what your top five values are. I said, don't, don't consult with one another. Do this alone and then bring it to me. <laughs> what happens is uh, they have two different ideas of the mission. And the values that they come into the marriage with are, not, are never similar. As a matter of fact, they're often contradictory and conflicting. You see, if you look at the marriage being for this purpose or this mission and your spouse sees it as a different purpose or a different mission, it's going to create conflict every time you make a decision. And it's not mere personality, friends. It's a value clash. And you must understand something about values. Values are things that you would die for or kill your spouse for. They're the things that make you pound the table. They're the things that you say, wait, I have, I have proven that this is correct. And, and, and guess what? If you're married to somebody whose values are different than yours, it's a source of constant conflict. Because the basis of decision making is completely different. And if the mission and why you believe we're together is different, then it's going to really put a whole different light on how you look at using resources, time, what you do with your life. You're going to constantly be living, not in intimacy, but maybe in a parallel kind of, uh, parallel kind of life together. So if you look at, are, are you tracking with me? You're, you're looking at me funny, so I'm just making sure. Uh, if you'll turn in your book, you have your book, page 36. We're going to look at the curriculum and then I'm going to take you to the scriptures to unpack some of this with you. Page 36. Notice that there, there are two different ideas of how you live your life, both as an individual and as a family. And both of these are essential for you to have more than just survival. God, God calls you and, and, and desires for you to flourish. Flourishing is the heart of God. He didn't call you into marriage to make you miserable or call you into a family to make you miserable. He called you into this life to flourish. 
I have come, Jesus said, that they might have life to the full. Every, everything that Jesus did, John 15 says, is so that you can bear much fruit and fruit that remains. In other words, God has a plan for greatness and we often settle for mediocrity. And so we want what he has and the only way to really have that fullness is when you begin to both know your calling, fight for your calling, establish your calling, but also live in your assignment. And um, in the book, Fred, write, Fred Hartley writes this. He says, the distinction between calling is calling has to do with identity. It's about who you are. Do you know, in the kingdom of God, and as a follower of Jesus Christ, is the only place that your identity is not behavior-based. It's relationship-based. Think about this, if in the world, if somebody lies, you call them a liar. It goes from behavior to identity. If somebody, you know, steals, we call them a thief. We give it an identity based on behavior. Only in Christ does the thief become a son. Amen. Or a liar become a daughter. Amen. Otherwise, their identity is set by their behavior. And so calling, you see, establishes, apart from behavior, who you are, your worth, your value. So when you, when you look at the list on calling, you start seeing that calling has to do with the grace of God and you living in the grace of God. It's, a, it's something above you. It doesn't change because it comes from God. It, it, it's true wherever you are. It's always expanding, getting bigger, getting more real in your life. It's unique to you because it's God's call on your life, on your family's life. There's a fulfillment to the calling of God that you will not find anywhere else because it is given by God. But I, see, calling is like this big concept and it's a, a big umbrella over your life in many ways. But the assignment is a response to the calling. It's, it's being obedient to God and where he puts you and where, where he sends you and what he gives you to do. So the assignment is really, uh, what is he asking you to do right now? And generally speaking, the calling and the assignment always have a, a close relationship to one another. But because he's God, sometimes he will assign you something that doesn't seem like it's part of your calling. And usually, it's because he's expanding your calling and he's giving you something that you can't do in your own gifting Amen. or in your own talents. <laughs> I love college students, but they can be pretty grandiose sometimes. All right, so they come to my church and they say, I wanna work with you. And I'm like, okay, what do you, what do you wanna do? And this one guy, I remember, he gave me his resume and it said he was the greatest preacher in our area. He was the greatest disciple maker. Nobody mentored better than he did. And the list just went on and on. I said, I should be interning for you then. So I told him this, you can come and clean the toilet. You can clean the bathrooms. You can set the chairs. Because if you can do that with anointing, then I'll believe you for the other. See, most people want to they want to take the job of the people they see respect and see glory in because they want that same glory. But an assignment might be clean the toilets. An assignment might be set the chairs. I don't know, how many, how many of you have ever heard of Louis, Louis Palau? He's one of the great evangelists of the world, one of the most awesome guys I've ever met. One night I got to have dinner with him and just asking him questions. How did you... How did you go from Chile to being a world-class evangelist? And he told this, me the story. He said when he was 16 years old, he heard the call of God. And as a 16-year-old, God said, I'm going to make you an evangelist to the world. <laughs> Louis Palau said, I didn't even know what an evangelist was. I had to go look it up. 
I said, I didn't know how to become this. I didn't know what to do. But the, a couple of days or so after he heard this call from God to be an evangelist to the world, Billy Graham crusade came to his, his city in Chile, Santiago. And he said, well, this guy's a world-class evangelist. Maybe I should go do something and see what it's like to be an evangelist. So he goes to the Billy Graham group and he says, I'll do anything you want me to do. I just want to be a part of this crusade. I'll serve in any way. And they, they gave him the task of setting up chairs. And he told me, he said, I set up those chairs with such anointing, they gave me a job. I was like, that's it. Amen. You know, we want to start at the top and we don't, you know, we're too grumbling or complaining to just do the assignment. I don't want to teach kids. I want to teach adults. I don't want, you know, I don't want to be in the nursery. I want to sing on stage. We never realize that it's, it's, it's actually manifesting that we don't understand our call because we're not willing to do our assignment. God will often put you in uncomfortable positions so that he can show you where your gifting talents end and where his infinite resources begin. Yeah. And he will do it so that you will learn to pray. Because without that kind of prayer, then there's no faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because you've got to know that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen. So you can see the, the list. Sometimes the assignment's beneath you. It can be changed. It can often be local. It can feel sometimes like it's less than or diminishing you. It's, it's often shared with other people. It's potentially very frustrating. Um, I want to give you a little, uh, a little insight into how both the calling and the assignment work. You will not get to the next level that God has for you without frustration. Frustration is not a sign of failure. Frustration means God is doing something new in your life. An artist does not paint without friction inside. A writer does not write a great work unless there's friction and frustration inside. And God creates in us often something new, something that hasn't been done before, something we long for. But he does it by frustrating us or putting us into frustrating situations. And often the curriculum of the Holy Spirit is to give you annoying and irritating people around you. <laughs> Even family members, maybe especially family members. Frustration is a sign that you do not have the resources for what God is leading you into yet. Frustration is when you go to prayer and you say, Lord, I need an upgrade. I need me 2.0. But see, what many of us do is we get frustrated, we quit. We stop. We say, this is too hard. Not realizing, see, in the assignment, frustration is part of the DNA. Because you will not go where you're not comfortable unless he makes you. And your, your comfort zone is always smaller than your potential. So God, who loves you, has to destabilize your comfort zone so he can get you to your potential. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Are you going through some of that? <laughs> right? And you can get angry with God or you can say, Lord, you're frustrating me because you have a plan for me. Amen. Because there are things that you have for me I can't get to unless I feel this friction, this dissatisfaction. And then... If you turn over a page, this is, this is helpful stuff. Just a couple of, of uh, illustrations, graphics 
of what happens when there's not a unity or a unified calling in a marriage. So you can have people who are saying, well, I feel like I'm called to this. And my wife says, I'm called to this. Husband says, I'm called to that. Sense of maybe the family is in a bit of conflict or turmoil because there's not a unity to the callings. This is, for me, is one of the amazing things of preaching and teaching on prayer all over the country. And especially one of my areas of specialty is revitalizing declining churches. Um, in one season of my life, the Lord called me to do autopsies on dead churches. I called it CSI Church. <laughs> so about 20 churches, I did in-depth studies on the, the decline, what were the, the causes of the decline. And it was interesting in many of the, the situations, uh, particularly as I was speaking with pastors and leaders in the church, there were almost always conflicting callings in the marriage. Even as I've, I've worked with a lot of people who are church planting, there is a sense often where one of the partners in the marriage says, I have a call to ministry, and the other doesn't sense any call to ministry whatsoever and is actually very upset that the church is taking away so much time from their marriage. I, I just, maybe this is just one of those very, you know, easy to see kind of things, but, but if people are contradictory in their callings, neither their marriage nor their ministry is going to last long. Because the demands on the marriage, time, resources, energy, all of those things are going to destroy the intimacy between the couple, which will destroy trust, which will eventually destroy the marriage. Now, one of the things that, that I realized is early on is that I loved ministry. I loved preaching. I loved teaching. I loved being really involved in people's lives. I loved that whole thing. And I gave my best to the ministry and I gave the leftovers to my family. And at one time, I, I, I really was called on the carpet by my wife and said, in many ways, your, your ministry is like a mistress I have to compete with. And I began to realize that that the battle that really mattered was the private battle. That whatever I say out in public has no real value if I haven't lived it out in private. That I haven't given my best to my wife and to my kids. If I haven't been the same person at home that I am in the pulpit, then everything I'm doing is fake. It's counterfeit. And so it's not the word of God that's going forth when I act like that. It's, it's my own need for approval and my own need for attention and control and all these other things. And they're just kind of subordinate to me. So as you look at, at these arrows, in a way, these are, just, these are just graphics. A unified kind of calling together really only comes when you go deeper into what is it to be called by God, period. What is it to, to really know one another, know your call, know how to be really, really intimate with God. So what I'd like to do is I, I'd like to unpack for you how Lisa, my, my Lisa, my wife, and I began to really go deep with God together into our calling individually as a couple. And our primary calling, as much as I love preaching, I love teaching and pastoring, my primary call is the presence of God. My primary call is my prayer life. Everything that I am and have that has any worth of value flows out of my call to him. I love my church, I love my students, I love all of those things, but my primary call is not to them, my primary call is to his presence. Amen. And so, I'd like you, if you have your Bible, would you 
turn with me to Jeremiah chapter one. And I want to show you some things. I want to unpack some things about how we get this whole matter biblically settled about our call. And especially what I'd like you to see with me is how relevant Jeremiah's call is to your life. I'm going to read a little bit because uh, I want you to have the whole, the whole picture here. Um, beginning at verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth. And said to me, I put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, I have, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that's boiling, I answered. It's tilting toward us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I'm about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdom, declares the Lord. The kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness and forsaking me in burning incense to other gods and in worshiping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready, stand up, say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you, and will rescue you, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth. As a, as a bride, you loved me. Followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord. The first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty. And disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. Here's what I'd like, like you to do. Would you turn to a neighbor? Somebody you can tolerate or they can tolerate you. Turn to them, look them in the eye. Okay, what I'm about to have you do, I'm gonna have you declare to your neighbor the same promise that God made to Jeremiah. You must understand that when you live in your calling, this promise belongs to you. So when you look at them, you gotta, you gotta say this to them, okay? And then you gotta say it kind of forcefully, all right? All right, ready? Repeat after me. Today. Ah, oh, that was weak. Come on, today. today. The Lord has made you, the Lord has made you. a fortified city, a fortified city. An, iron an iron pillar, a bronze wall. A bronze wall. You, will you will stand against the whole land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For the Lord is with you and will rescue you. Doesn't that feel good? You know, those aren't your words. I had you say it to somebody else, but they're saying it back to you. You see, when you live in your calling, you live in his promises. And his promises are already reality. But when you don't live in your calling, you live in your own strength. You live in your own gifting, your own talents. And so then 
He will let you discover the limits of yourself. But when you put yourself into the calling of God and you begin to say, this is who I am, this is, and to even together to say, this is who we are, then those promises, God makes you a fortified city. He doesn't say things won't come against you. He says, you'll have fortified walls when they do. And when they do, you'll be like an iron pillar. Nothing can move you and everything about your family can be built on you. You'll be a brass wall. Nothing's going to get past you. And why is that? Because the Lord himself will overcome them for you. And he will rescue you from whatever situation you find yourself in. But you have to begin to acknowledge that there is such a thing over your life as calling. This is not for pastors or missionaries alone. It's for every believer. Amen. Every believer. Amen. We are the priesthood of all believers. Amen. God wants you to hear your calling and then to operate in that calling. And sometimes people will say to me, because I use Jeremiah all the time to talk about calling. They'll say, well, that was Jeremiah. Let me tell you, the pattern of Jer- Jeremiah's calling is the pattern of the way God calls every person. Amen. And when you see the way he calls, you'll begin to understand how essential it is for you to hear him and begin to walk in your calling. So the first thing I want to I, I want to unpack a little bit with you is how relevant this passage is. So in those days, in those days, Judah had become a fragmented society. So a fragmented society is a society where nobody knows what's right or wrong, what's true or false, and everybody's trying to determine for themselves what is moral, what's immoral, you know. And so everybody has their own opinion, and everybody has their own religion, and everybody has their own faith, and all of these things, and nothing is absolute, and nothing has any authority. Now, I don't know about Arkansas, but that's exactly what's going on in New York, where I live. I live in a fragmented society. And so God calls a young man who's actually a teenager. And he calls this teenager and he says, you will be over nations. You will be my my prophet, my witness, my spokesperson. Now, if you know anything about traditional societies, Teenagers are to keep quiet. Only older people get to speak. Teenagers are to be quiet. And yet God is saying, the one who will speak for me is a teenager. Now, what that means is this. The sovereign Lord himself gives the call. And it doesn't have anything to do with the qualifications of the one being called. As a matter of fact, the call is what qualifies him. He's not qualified for the call. He's not a preacher. He says, I don't even know how to speak. He's never written a book. He's never done anything. So he has no qualifications for the call. The call qualifies him. That's pretty significant because a lot of us will say, well, I, I don't know enough or I'm not good at speaking. That's exactly what Jeremiah said. So guess what? The call of God is on your life, so the call qualifies you. Even if you have a a bad past or you have a lot of failures in your past, it doesn't matter. It's not that relevant. As a matter of fact, what I find is often God will redeem your mistakes and your failures and even your gross sins and will make that a place of ministry for you. Because you see, when he calls, he qualifies. Are you hearing me that the fact of the matter is none of you today can leave here and say, well, I'm not qualified. Because Jeremiah was not qualified. And yet he was called and so are you. So are each one of you. And so this call in that day and time 
was really powerful. And, and, and Jeremiah was actually a reluctant prophet. You know, he, he, he said, I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to do this. And then in verse 9, it says, God put his word in his mouth. See, one of the things that I've, I've started to really see is that some people will say, well, I'm not qualified, and they kind of live in a sort of introverted and, and closed off way saying, you know, what I have to say or do isn't that important or it's not that valuable, nobody's going to listen to me. And then there are other people who just talk all the time, who are addicted talkers. And they, you know, if there is a moment in church, they'll, they'll testify and they'll talk or they'll start praying and you're just like, please, please stop, please end this, please. Because they'll pray about the whole world and everybody and they'll preach in their, their, their prayer and all this stuff and you're just like, good grief. You see, he doesn't put you over nations with your personality. He puts you over nations with his word. It was the word in Jeremiah, spoken through Jeremiah, that had power. It wasn't Jeremiah's words, it was the Lord's words. And it was his words that had a power and authority. And what we see quite often is we want our words to have power and authority. But the problem is, especially with a husband or a wife or mother or father or a teacher or whatever it is, when it, they're your words and you're trying to control people, then you authority, you're using control. So you're willing to intimidate, to manipulate, deceive, whatever it is, because your words, you're going to have to use your words to control the people, control your children. And many of us don't realize that we have a far better thing with authority than we do with control. Amen. You see, because God's word will not return void. It will accomplish its purposes. His, he himself will empower his word. Jeremiah was given a promise before he spoke that what he was going to do was going to accomplish what God had set out for him to do. So in every way, every way that he has called you, if you allow his words access and his word and, and you're living responsively. See, most of, my problem with most prayer meetings is we're telling God what to do. And we're telling him how to do it and when to do it. And guess what? We don't know anything. Do you know what anxiety is? Anxiety is when I think I know better than God what should be happening. God, this shouldn't be happening. Or I think I deserve what I think should happen and it's not happening. Anxiety is an emotion that dethrones God and sets me above him. And guess what God says about anxiety? Be anxious for nothing because it is a form of idolatry and so when you pray as an anxious person you've already dis you've already disconnected the connection and anxiety is usually unbelief as well so what we see in this call of Jeremiah is that the word of God is going to accomplish in this teenager exactly what God called him to do. And guess what God says as the very first two um, prophetic pictures, right? You may have read this before. The book of Jeremiah is probably one of the most difficult books in the whole Old Testament to understand. The reason is it's not in chronological order, so you can't just find the history of it it actually goes back and forth in the history of Judah. It's not in topical order, so you can't arrange it by topics. So you have to really go in there and study it because it has these amazing truths in it. And so you have to look at the context of these truths and go, God, what are you saying in these two things? So the, 
the, the first two images, prophetic images that Jeremiah, the teenager, gets are the almond tree and the boiling pot. All right, so any of you that, that are kind of into visions or pictures or whatever, have you ever noticed that sometimes you just sit there going, God, what in the world does this mean? And if you're really prophetic, usually what happens is God's giving you insights that nobody else wants to hear. Because you're a year or 18 months ahead. And most of the things that God gives you prophetically, it's not going to happen for three years, but it feels like it needs to happen right now. And so most people who are very prophetic feel very misunderstood. I, one of the, I, I'm pretty prophetic and... I see things way in advance and I start telling people, God showed me this, God showed me this. And they just say, yeah, we don't want to hear that. Shut up. You know, and it's no, you know, it's not important. Who cares? It's not important to me right now. A year later, they come and they go, God showed me this, this and this. And it's exactly what I told them a year ago. I'm so angry at that point at them. (laughs) I wasted my breath on you. But God does this with prophetic people because again, he doesn't want us to feel special because we have messages. And he doesn't want us to get our, you know, our identity from our gifts. So he gives us frustrating things sometimes. And he says, I'm gonna give you something to carry. You're gonna carry this for me. So he gives Jeremiah two things to carry. The first is the almond tree. Now the picture of the almond tree in, in Palestine or in the Holy Land is this. It's the first tree that blooms in spring. And so what God was saying to Jeremiah is, I am giving you early the word of life. And the almond tree actually is a guardian over spring. They see it as a guardian over spring. And he's saying this to Jeremiah, as long as as you stay in your calling, as long as you keep my words in your mouth and in your heart, it will always flourish. I will always guard it. I will always make it come to pass. None of your words will fall to the ground. Now, if you're not really into, if you're not really into what God wants to do with your life, these words are not that important that I'm saying to you. Because if you're just religious, this, this isn't going to ha- enhance your religion. But if you love Jesus with all your heart and you want his word and you want results and you want impact, then what you need to hear is God gives a picture and says, I will guard my word. I will guard your words. I will guard your work. I will guard your ministry. I will make it to where everything you are saying is springtime, even if it's winter. And you see, you have to hold on to that. There are many of us, we know what God has told us. And we know what God has called us to. And the almond tree reminds you, he gave it to you in spring. Don't lose it in the winter. Don't lose it when it's tough. Don't forget that this tree tells you it's guarded, it's going to blossom, it's going to flourish. Second, come on, I I can't say it a lot better than that. And you guys are just sitting there, come on. Can you not feel that in your heart? There are things some of you, he might have told you 20 years ago and you forget it or you give up on it. And he says, no, remember the almond tree. Remember what I told you. That's right. It's not your dream. It was my dream I gave to you. Amen. Hold on to it. For the family, for your kids, for your grandkids. Some of the dearest things are the promises God has made for our family. And we have to hold on to it. The second thing is, he says there's a boiling pot. Again, it says like, Lord, why is this so important? It, well, it's essential for this reason. Josiah was the king of Judah. And Josiah was, a, Josiah was an interesting man. You know that he was eight years old when he became king. He was raised by the priest, the high priest. 
He only lived to about 39 years old, but in his lifetime, he was devoted to the Lord and he started a revival. Even a reformation when they found the scriptures that had been lost and they saw how far they were from the word of the Lord, Josiah led them back to a true worship of Yahweh. But Josiah had an issue. He was very devoted to the religious aspect, but he didn't trust the Lord for the politics. So he's always making little alliances, Assyria, Egypt. And Assyria was starting to lose its power. The secession plan of the emperors was not working out and Assyria was losing its power. And Josiah was thinking, if I go in with Egypt, we can break the yoke of Assyria. And so he was consumed with Assyria and Egypt. And God said, you're looking in the wrong direction, Josiah. Assyria is nothing. Egypt is nothing. But there's a boiling pot. And it's coming from the north. And nobody knows about it yet. But it's called Babylon. He tells this teenager something the king doesn't even know. He tells this teenager what the future will be, what the real threat is. You see, because the issue when they get carried to Babylon is not that Babylon is so strong. The issue is that the people don't trust their God. It is not because Babylon was strong, it's because Judah was wicked. And what you see throughout the book of Jeremiah is the call of God is always to be God-centric, not politics-centric. The call of God is to say, no, the issue isn't how strong this country or this army or whatever it is. The issue is the righteousness of God. And he tells this teenager, the trouble isn't Assyria. The trouble isn't Egypt. The trouble is a trouble you don't even know about yet, but I do. But the people are not listening to me. So what you see here, and, and I'm trying to explain to you what the call really is. It's not just I'm called to be a pastor, or I'm called to be a missionary. The call is to stand in a place of tension. When you really know your calling, what, what's going on is this. You are between two pressures. It's, it's, it's inescapable, this tension, this pressure. On the one hand, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are intimately connected to the holiness of God and the righteousness of God. And you yourself who, 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 who have no righteousness of your own have become the righteousness of God in Christ. So you are completely connected to his holiness and his purity and his righteousness, but you're still in a world that's fragmented and wants nothing to do with holiness, that wants nothing to do with purity and is actually angry that you would ask that they would deal with their guilt or their shame or their sin. And so what you find in Jeremiah is you find the very place where the calling puts you and me. You know the holiness of God, but you also know the brokenness of your family. And you know the brokenness of your community. And you cannot, if you're going to walk with God, you cannot help but feel both unless you turn God off. And say, well, I'm just going to live over here. I'm just going to live as best I can. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do this. It's why many people quit praying. It's not because they don't, you don't get answers when you pray. It's because something else happens when you really pray. One, there is this calling to God, but there's this other thing that's in this text. Numerous times, over and over again, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Now, in Hebrew, it's, it's not word. It's the burden of the Lord. 
See, you can't really be intimate with God. You can't really pray without him saying, I want to share my burden with you. So see, if all your prayer is about, God, I want, you know, I want a better job, I want more money, I want to have better health, I want to have all this, then, then what you're doing is you're saying, God, I'm going to keep you at arm's length. I'm just going to pray my list. And then I'm going to see how many things you answer. But see, when you're in your calling, then you are caught in that middle of the, of the great you know, awesomeness of our God, the wonder of our God, his transcendence, his eminence, his, his sovereignty, all of these things are, are, are connecting with you. And then you're living in a world that's fragmented and broken. And here's, this is the interesting thing to me. The Lord has more confidence in you than you have. He knows more about your future than you'll ever know. He knows where the boiling pots are. But what he wants to do is he wants you to carry some of that burden. The reason that Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet is because he's carrying the broken heart of our God for his people. As a matter of fact, he, he, he explains it here in a way that is so incredible. He, he says, Jeremiah, I want you to understand. I don't see these people as people who are made to keep my law. I see these people as a bride that I married. So in the scriptures, when it is recounting that the people of God break the law of God, it doesn't say they broke the law. It says they committed spiritual adultery. So what you find here is not just that you break his law, but that you break his heart. Amen. And so when you begin to read the prophetic word here and God's, God's sorrow and God, God's pain in a sense and his brokenheartedness, you don't look at it and say, our God is harsh and mean and cruel. No, you look at it and go, our God is a husband Amen. who had a honeymoon with his wife where, where he gave her everything and he protected her and he, he, he gave her the shoes on her feet. He gave her everything she needed. But as soon as she got comfortable, as soon as she got settled, she went and ran after other gods. And what God is saying to Jeremiah, I'm calling you to bear my burden for my broken bride. So you see, prayer can't just be religious. As a matter of fact, I don't think your life can just be religious. It has to be passionate. <laughs> you know the only thing that, that Jeremiah, like, or that God, I would say, through Jeremiah uses to describe how he designed us, how he made us passionate? He said... They're like donkeys in heat. I love Jeremiah because I get to talk about really nasty things in church. And they're right there in the scripture, so nobody can really give me a hard time for it. But he says, you're like donkeys in heat sniffing around. But he says, don't work too hard. They'll come find you. Now, here's what this means. It's not about the sexual ethics of, of Israel or Judah. It's about their spiritual design. I don't know if you know this or not, but you were designed with intense spiritual passion. You were designed with intense spiritual passion. He, he can own, the only thing that has an analogy to your spiritual passion is, is sexual desire. That's the only thing that's even close to the way he's designed you. And what he's saying to Jeremiah is, I meant for them to invest and give all of that spiritual passion to me, but they've given it to everything else. 
And he makes it really clear what they've given it to. They've given it to other gods for their security because they feel insecure. They've given it to other gods for their power. They've given it for fertility. They've given it for success. Now, you and I may not go worship at the altars or the trees or the high places, but those issues are still alive today. How do I get secure? How do I get success? How do I satisfy my cravings, my drives, my addictions, my obsessions? How do I get those things done? You see, God says, I made you to have that much passion, but the only place that you can find the fulfillment is in me. But he says, my heart is broken because I'm on the verge of divorce with my bride. My heart is broken because everything that I've given to her, she thinks the other gods gave it to her. Hosea tells it really clearly. You know the story of Hosea where God says, go and marry a prostitute. And Hosea marries Gomer and they have children and you can tell she's already cheating on Hosea while they're married. How do I know? Because one of the kids is named not my kid. Right? That's a pretty, I mean, go through the whole life and you're not my kid, Ben Hosea or whatever, you know? So she leaves him. You remember that? She leaves him and she goes with another man who basically is like a pimp who pimps her out. And she's, she's, you know, not being fed. She's sick. She's not clothed properly. And God says to Hosea, that's powerful. He says, go, take her food, and take her money. And he goes. And guess what? The pimp answers the door. And Hosea gives this man who's abusing Gomer, he gives this man the money and the clothing and the food. And guess what the man does? He takes it to her and plays like he gave it to her takes the credit and God said that's that's what's going on in the lives of my people they think their gods their lover gods are providing for them but they're just taking credit I'm the one giving them money I'm the one giving them the food I'm the one giving them the clothing but they give glory to their oppressor instead of giving glory to their husband. See, you can kind of see if you really want to pray, if you really want to pray and say, Lord, teach us to pray. One, you got you to go deeper than just having a list. You got to start coming to God and saying, God, I'm called to be with you. I'm called to have your word in my mouth. I'm called to live a life under the guard, the guard of the almond tree. I'm, I'm called to bloom. I'm called to flourish. You will guard my life, my word, my ministry, my effectiveness. Even when it's winter in my life, it will be spring. Amen. I'm called not to look at what's going on right now, but to listen to you for the boiling pots. Because you know the end from the beginning. And you share your secrets with those who are intimate with you. Jesus says, you're not my slaves, you're my friends, because I make known to you what my plans are. But don't be surprised if when he opens his heart to you, there's brokenness about your family. There's brokenness over the church. There's pain over our community. I know the plans the Lord said I have for you, plans for your welfare, plans to prosper to you, to give you a future and a hope. But many of us have turned the other way. See, it's not that prayer doesn't work. It's that prayer is hard. It's because real prayer, prayer is passionate. I was doing a, leading a, a prayer summit for the leadership in my district. And uh, 
you know, it was a, it was a district executive committee type thing and we were gonna meet for two days. And so we started with prayer and worship and the presence of the Lord came so powerfully that we didn't stop for a day and a half. I mean, we stopped to go eat, we stopped to have sleep, but we just kept praying and praying and worshiping for a day and a half. Pastors were on their faces repenting. People were on their knees, weeping was taking place. It was really powerful. We got more done in that time than we had at any other meetings I had been a part of. But kind of along the way, towards the end, one of the pastors raised his hand to me and said, can I just say something about prayer? I said, sure. He goes, I really don't think you need to pray like this. He says, I get up every morning, I read my Bible, I write my prayers list, I pray for a few minutes and then I go about my day. I think this is just too much. You know, and it kind of struck me that he had not been repenting. He had not been being honest. He had not been passionate. So I just, you know, I didn't have a lightning bolt to smite him with. So, uh, <laughs> so I just said, okay, Lord, what, what's going on? This doesn't feel good. doesn't feel right. A few months later, Find out he left the ministry because he'd been having an affair. See, he was dispassionate in his prayer life, but he was passionate with his mistress. God made you with that much spiritual passion, but he made it to be satisfied in him. And the truth is, see, when it's, when it's all out for him, then you're the best wife, the best husband, the best parent, because he will give, as you give to him, he will give back to you everything you need for that life of godliness and life and godliness. But if you're, if even your family, which is a good thing, is where all your passion goes, then the family becomes an idol. Or even I adore my wife, but she is not the source of my life or the source of my joy. She points me to the source, but she's not the source. He's the source. And then I get to give her what I receive from him instead of trying to get from her what I can only get from him. So she doesn't become an idol, she becomes a blessing. Think about this as we close this time. Idols are almost always good things, not sinful things. Wood in and of itself is not a sinful thing until you make the wood something it's not supposed to be. A stone or, or precious metal is not a sinful thing until you make it an ultimate thing. Anything that you've made your treasure, anything that you've made ultimate is your idol. And God will not resource your idolatry and he will not give your idol success. So would you stand with me? I want us to do, is this making sense to you? Here's what he said to Jeremiah and I'm going to ask you to do the same with me would you close your eyes with me for a minute I'm going to tell you what he I'm going to remind you what he said and then I'm, we're going to we're going to respond to it he said to Jeremiah get yourself ready I believe I'm here today to tell you to get yourself ready. The Lord is going to use you in a way like never before. Some of your frustration is because God is taking you to a new level, a new season. You can't take the old baggage into a new season. He says, stand up and say to them whatever I command you. 
Do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. So in some ways you could boil it down to this, trust in God and no one else. You think about it, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, all, all your ways acknowledge him. Even our trust in others sometimes conflicts with our trust in God. Do not be terrified by anyone. Reverence the Lord and fear no one else, or love the Lord and fear no one else. So would you say this with me, if you're, if you're willing. Lord, I'm ready for a new season, for new ministry, for a deeper prayer life. I'm ready for my calling and I'm saying yes to my assignment. I will not, come on, say it again. I will not be terrified by anyone. I trust in you like no one else. I reverence you. I love you. And I fear no one else. Say that one more time. I fear no one else. As we, as we just use this as a place for the Lord to speak to us right now. And your eyes are closed. Can you see that place where he's saying, trust me? It usually has something to do with the future. Often has to do with circumstances right now in the present. Sometimes it's people or a job or a situation where it, there's a lot of frustration or friction. Would you look at that place with the eyes of your heart and say, Lord, I trust you in this place. I will not be afraid. Here's the thing. Every real prayer warrior, every true like intimate of God, there comes a time where he says, do you love me for me? Or do you love me for what I do for you? I believe right here today, he's been working in your life in such a way. He's even closed some doors. He's even said no to some things that could have been, maybe even should have been. But he's saying to you, do you love me for me or do you love me for the open door? Do you love me for what you did, you know, when I give you what you want or do you love me for me no matter what? You see, when he's your treasure, when he's ultimate, then he can pour out every other thing that you need. But if what you need is ultimate to you, he will not be your assistant. So I'm asking you today to put a stake in the ground and say, Lord, I love you for you. I love you for you. Even though you slay me still, I will hope in you. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Is there somebody that you could just lay a hand on their shoulder next to you? Is there somebody that you could just gather with right now? Somebody that you can just put your hand on their shoulder, you can get together. Would you just play, a, it doesn't have to be long, but I feel like God has given words of new seasons, new levels. Would you just pray over each other for a minute? Pray blessing. Maybe you're hearing something from the Lord. Would you just speak that to them? Uh, tears are beautiful. Don't be walled up today. 
don't be reserved there's a tension you see you're standing between the holiness of God and the brokenness of our families the brokenness of our community our own brokenness but he wants to put his word in you right now a word of hope a word of promise a word of blessing the favor of the Lord would you just speak something to each other and then we'll take a break